Did you know that in the last year alone, rates of anxiety and depression doubled in the United States? It can often take weeks to get a traditional therapy appointment, and these can be expensive. Well, Cerebral is an online mental health service that offers prescription medication, counselling and therapy for anxiety, depression, ADHD, insomnia and more. It's okay to not be okay. Cerebral is one of the few services out there to provide prescription medication online through a licensed provider, and they ship it right to your front door. You can message your care team on Cerebral at any point, and through the app, you essentially have them with you everywhere you go. You can schedule sessions with your counsellor or therapist at any given time, and it's totally affordable. In fact, it's a third the price of traditional therapy, and there are options with or without insurance. Morbidology listeners get 65% off their first month of medication management and care counselling at GetCerebral.com slash Morbidology. Click the link in my show notes or go to GetCerebral.com slash Morbidology for 65% off your first month. That's just a total of $30 to get yourself started. Join Cerebral today on their mission to make quality mental health care accessible and affordable for all. Welcome to Morbidology. I'm your host, Emily G. Thompson, author of Unsolved Child Murders, Cults Uncovered, Mysteries Uncovered, and co-author of Unsolved Murders, True Crime Cases Uncovered. Join Morbidology on Patreon for exclusive episodes of Morbidology Plus, exclusive merch, ad-free and early release episodes, and much more. Woodland Park is a city located just a 20-minute drive up the Ute Pass from the picturesque Colorado Springs, Colorado, United States. The convenient mountain enclave is known as the city above the clouds and is the perfect location for those who love to be in the great outdoors. In 1992, the city would be rocked by a shocking double murder. A double murder that would only be discovered when a teenage boy came into school to confess to his role. One couple who called Woodland Park home were 57-year-old Kermode Jordan and his wife, 41-year-old Pamela Jordan. Kermode had been an engineer at Digital Equipment Corporation since 1986 while Pamela was an administrative assistant at Care and Share Food Pantry. The couple were married in Las Vegas in November of 1982. Both Kermode and Pamela had children from earlier relationships. Kermode had a son named Cameron, while Pamela had a 15-year-old son, Jacob, and a 17-year-old son, Charles. Kermode and Pamela had met in San Jose, California, around four years after she divorced Jacob and Charles's father. Charles. The boys would see their father, Charles, every other weekend and during the summer and Christmas. When they were 13 and 9 years old, the family moved from California to Colorado after Kermode accepted a job at Digital Equipment Corporation. Charles and Jacob were enrolled at Woodland Park Schools, where they enjoyed sports and both participated in forensic classes. Charles had suffered from hearing and sight problems, but he was a good student earning impressive grades. Jacob had to repeat the eighth grade at the persistence of Kermode and Pamela. In the summer of 1992, Jacob started taking guitar lessons, and in November, he had a recital with his mother, who played the flute. Kermode was also learning to play an instrument, the saxophone. It was the 18th of December, 1992, when Woodland Park Police received a phone call from Pamela's employer at Care and Share Food Pantry. He asked them to conduct a welfare check on Pamela because she hadn't arrived into work 
like scheduled. Woodland Park Police embarked on the family's affluent mountain home located in Ridge Drive, just northwest of Woodland Park. It was around 11.50am when a police officer checked the perimeter of the home but found nothing unusual. Around the same time, Woodland Police received a phone call from a counsellor and school principal at Woodland Park High School. They had a very disturbing story to relay. That morning, Pamela's 15-year-old son, Jacob Eind, had arrived at school via school bus. He was a freshman at the school. He had attended his first two classes before approaching the school counsellor and principal. He told them that he had been awoken that morning by the sound of gunshots. He said that his friend, 17-year-old Gabriel Adams, then entered his bedroom and chillingly stated, I killed your parents. Jacob claimed he walked into his parents' bedroom, found that they were still breathing, and as he said, I finished them off. The responding officer, who was standing outside the family's home, then entered through an unlocked door. It was eerily quiet as he progressed through the home. When he approached the master bedroom, he couldn't open it. It was locked. He managed to break his way through and found Kermode lying face down on the floor, surrounded in a puddle of blood. Pamela was lying half on top of her husband, and it appeared as though she was embracing him. The Colorado Bureau of Investigations was called to the scene. They cordoned off the home and conducted their examination, collecting evidence including blood-spattered carpet and plasterboard. Evidence inside the home indicated that Commode and Pamela had put up a tough battle for their lives. They had both been shot as they slept in their bed, but it was evident that they had gotten out of bed and attempted to flee their attackers. However, they were then bombarded with bullets that had been fired from two separate handguns, determined to be a .357 calibre and a .22 calibre. When these gunshot wounds didn't kill the couple, their killers then launched at them with knives, slashing their arms and hands as they desperately attempted to defend themselves. Ultimately, their autopsy would conclude that it was a single .357 calibre bullet fired point-blank to their heads that had killed them. Kermode had sustained a number of gunshot wounds, including three gunshot wounds to the head, one from each gun. Pamela had sustained a number of gunshot wounds too, including one to the head. It was determined that the murders had taken at least five minutes to complete. Fourth Judicial District Attorney John Suther stated, Immediately upon seeing the scene, I saw that this did not take place real quickly. There had probably been a shooting, then an episode involving some terror, and then some further shooting. There was some period of time when there was a struggle. 15-year-old Jacob and 17-year-old Gabriel were arrested and charged with the two murders. Jacob was arrested at school and when the sheriff's deputies arrived, he kept trying to speak to them about what had happened. Police Chief John Hogue said, We kept saying, Son, we can't talk to you. We can't take statements from you. By law, we could not talk to him until he had a guardian. Both the teenagers were ordered to be held without bond at the Zebulon Pike Detention Centre. Around a mile away from the family's home, investigators embarked on Gabriel's home. Inside, they found a long-barreled .22 calibre pistol, a 4-inch Colt Python handgun and a knife. All of the weapons were removed from the home for a forensic examination to be conducted. By sight alone, it was evident that all of the weapons were coated in coagulated blood. As news of the murders and arrests were reported in the media, the community recoiled in horror. The murders were absolutely horrific, and to hear that Pamela's own teenage son and a friend had carried them out was unfathomable to the locals. Parricide is the killing of one's parents. It accounts for around 2% of all homicides in the United States, around 300 each year. Most of these cases, however, involve children that kill their abusive parents. According to Times Magazine, typically the child who commits parricide is between 16 and 18 years old, and they come from a white, middle-class family. Most have above-average intelligence with schoolwork below average. They are typically well-adjusted in school 
and the community, but most tend to be isolated and without many friends. Tributes for the couple came pouring in, with Jack Kellogg, a digital spokesman, stating, This is a shock to all of us. Kermode was with us since 1986 and was well-liked by everybody at Digital. He was a good engineer and well-respected. Counselors from Teller County Social Services would be called to Woodland Park School to speak with the students and offer further services if needs be. Jacob was not known to police, but Gabriel had regularly aroused suspicions due to his obsession with martial arts and what he described as war games in the woods. The community would be left wondering what kind of motivation there could have been behind the seemingly random murders. According to students who knew Jacob and his brother Charles, however, they had often spoken about trouble at home. In fact, Charles had even moved out of the family home. This led to speculation that Jacob could have been abused at home. The investigation was still in its very early days, and Steve Clifton, director of the county's Department of Social Services, said, there's no substantiated abuse. Jacob was said to be born in the wrong decade. He was a 60s enthusiast who often wore bell-bottom jeans and tight-fitting shirts. He was described by some of his classmates as being a flower child. Some said he dressed this way only for attention and the next day would be wearing more modern attire. In school, he typically earned top grades and he enjoyed drafting class. Christian Zajak, who was in his class, said, He would say stuff to get the teachers to like him more, and everyone could tell he was trying to get the teachers to like him more. Gabriel was nicknamed Major because of his penchant for wearing a green army jacket. Christian would say, Everyone knew he was crazy, but we didn't know he was that crazy. Some classmates said that Gabriel kept blow darts and other weapons hidden in his locker at school, and it even suggested a blow gum war at Halloween but everybody turned him down. Much like Jacob, Gabriel too was a good student and earned above average grades. On the 21st of December, Kermode and Pamela were laid to rest. Their funeral was held at Mountain View Methodist Chapel and it was led by Reverend William Wolfe. Following the service, they were cremated at Mountain Memorial Funeral Home. Towards the end of the month, Jacob and Gabriel were charged as adults with first-degree murder. They were additionally charged with conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and a crime of violence. Jacob was also charged with solicitation of first-degree murder and was accused of attempting to persuade another classmate to kill Kermode and Pamela between the 1st of October and the 15th of December. Since the two teenagers were charged as adults, this meant that if convicted they would be facing a sentence of life in prison without parole. Due to the fact that they were both under the age of 18, they would not be eligible for the death penalty. Following the charges, Jacob and Gabriel were transferred to the El Paso County Criminal Justice Centre, where they would be housed separately and held without bond. At the time of the arrest, prosecutors had been pushing for a bill to be passed, which would allow more youths to be tried as adults. An identical bill which had been backed by the Colorado District Attorney's Council the year prior never made it out of State House Committee because of the hefty price tag. It would have been a 10-year, $3 million price tag. Nevertheless, Senator Ray Pars, who pushed for the first bill, would try once more. Fourth Judicial District Attorney John Suthers said, This is not the time to be showing up asking for sentence increases, but the district attorneys, as a group, feel there is not enough public protection from violent juvenile offenders. Under the current Colorado Children's Code, juvenile offenders are sent to special institutions that provide counselling and schooling. The maximum sentence is five years. A prosecutor could try a juvenile as an adult, but only in two circumstances. If the juvenile is under 14 years old and charged with first-degree murder, or if the juvenile is 16 years or older and has been charged with a felony within two years of another felony conviction. In other instances, however, a district attorney could ask the court for special permission to try a juvenile as an adult. But when this happens, there's a certain criteria that must be followed. Under the new bill that was being proposed, prosecutors would be able to automatically try juveniles as adults, 
if the offender is 16 years old or older and charged with a felony wherein a weapon is involved. According to the FBI, violent crime perpetrated by juveniles had increased during the 1980s, with the arrest rate among white juveniles for violent crimes increasing by 44%, and among black juveniles for violent crimes increasing by 19%. The bill was met with a lot of criticism, especially from defence attorneys and children's advocates, who believe that juvenile offenders, regardless of the crime, do not belong in an adult prison. They argued that juveniles can be better rehabilitated in a juvenile facility as opposed to an adult prison that would do nothing more than turn them inside out and make them even more dangerous and likely to reoffend on the outside. Early the following year, Jacob and Gabriel appeared in the 4th Judicial District Court, where Judge Mary Jane Looney was handed over sealed reports on the two teenagers by the Teller County Department of Social Services. She scheduled a motions hearing for the 14th of January. At the later motions hearing, Judge Looney would grant permission to the defence attorneys and the attorneys who represented the Jordan's estate access to the crime scene. They would appear in court once more in February for a preliminary hearing to decide whether there was enough evidence for Jacob and Gabriel to stand trial. The hearing would be the first time that the public got to hear many details about the double murder and it was evident that Jacob and Gabriel were offering polarising versions of events. According to Jacob, he was the victim of abuse at home and he had hired Gabriel to shoot and kill Kermode and Pamela. According to Gabriel, however, it was self-defence. Jacob's friend, 17-year-old David Maybe, revealed that when Jacob came to school the morning after the shootings, he appeared to be extremely nervous and suspicious. He told the courtroom he was kind of looking around. He said he was thinking of going home and shooting himself. David was so concerned about Jacob that he informed Woodland Park High School officials. Jacob was called out of class by Woodland Park principal James Taylor, and Jacob said to the principal, They hit me and I couldn't take it any more, in reference to Kermode and Pamela. During the hearing, very few details about the alleged abuse were detailed, but it was said that Jacob had been the victim of abuse at home and that his stepfather, Kermode, became irrational and violent when drunk. His brother Charles had told investigators that Kermode had a drinking problem and the family had to hide guns and knives in the home whenever he was drinking. Principal Taylor told the courtroom that Jacob told him that he had woken at around 1.10am by the distinct sound of gunshots coming from the master bedroom of the family home. This was expected, however, because Jacob said he had paid Gabriel to come to his home and kill his mother and stepfather. He said that he ran into the bedroom to see that his mother, Pamela, had been wounded and that Gabriel was struggling with his stepfather, Kermode. He said that he heard Gabriel refer to Kermode during the scuffle as a hypocritical bastard. Jacob said that he shouted at Gabriel, They're not dead, you fucked it up. He said that he fired one shot into Kermode's head, and then shot his mother but missed, and had to fire a second time. He told Principal Taylor, Unfortunately, I had to finish them off. According to Principal Taylor, When Jacob confessed to him, he looked very shocked, tired, and in disbelief about what he had done. Jacob confided in his principal that after killing his mother and stepfather, he went back to bed. He said that the last thing he remembered was Gabriel standing next to his bed with a knife in his hand, and that it was dripping with blood. He awoke at around 5am, had breakfast, and then got ready for school, taking the regular school bus that stopped near the family's home. Before police arrived at the school to arrest Jacob, a teacher, Lucinda Reed, had taped a conversation he had made to her. Jacob had told Lucinda that he and Gabriel had planned for the murders to look like a burglary gone wrong. Jacob said to his teacher he decided to kill his mother and stepfather because they constantly made demands of him, adding that they had arranged for him to go to counselling but then never actually let him go. Teller County Sheriff's Deputy, Dennis Ogden, had been the first officer on the scene. He testified that he kicked in the locked master bedroom door. He found that the bedroom was in disarray. There was an overturned planter, a smashed ceramic duck, 
and sheet music which had been strewn across the floor. He told the courtroom the blood stained the door jam, the carpet and the bed. There were two .22 calibre slugs on the floor, close to the bed as well as at least three bullet holes in the wall. On the bed he found a box of bullets that was spattered with blood. Next, he spoke about the bodies of Kermode and Pamela. Both were clad in pyjamas and both were on the floor of the master bedroom, with Kermode's feet extended into the bedroom. He said that his body was soaked with blood and there was a .357 calibre bullet wound just above his right eye, a .22 calibre wound above his right eye, and bullet wounds to his right shoulder and arm. He had also been stabbed in the back of the head and there were knife wounds to his hands and arms, which indicated that he had put up a fight and attempted to defend himself from the knife attack. Underneath his lifeless body, he found a leather gun case with a 12-gauge shotgun inside and a .357 calibre gun holster, which was empty. Pamela was found curled around her husband's body. She had a .357 calibre wound to her right temple, as well as .22 calibre wounds to her shoulders. She had wounds from a knife to the side and back of her head and to her cheek and hands, indicating that she too had put up a struggle but to no avail. Blood found inside the home came back as a match to either Jacob or Gabriel, but only Gabriel was treated for wounds that were bleeding. The guns had been found in Gabriel's bedroom. Gabriel had provided a different version of events, instead telling investigators that around 11pm he had gone to his friend Jacob's home to show him how to use a sword. He claimed that Jacob had led him into a dark room in the home and suddenly gunfire erupted. Gabriel said he thought that Jacob was trying to kill him and blamed Jacob for the murders. He claimed that he hadn't shot a gun and had simply tried to defend himself with a sword. Testimony would also be heard that Jacob had tried to enlist another classmate to kill Kermode and Pamela, but this classmate had refused. He had allegedly paid Gabriel $2,000 to commit the murders, and they had spoken about potentially poisoning the couple's coffee or spraying them with bear mace, which they had seemingly believed was a poisonous chemical. They had apparently settled on shooting the couple, believing that the murders would be quick and painless. The truth, however, was quite the contrary. Judge Looney would determine that there was enough evidence against Jacob and Gabriel to send them to trial, and in March they would be arraigned as adults. Gabriel pleaded not guilty, while Jacob and his defence team asked for a delay in entering his plea. They were considering putting forward a defence of mental impairment and they needed time for a psychiatric examination. Defence attorney Sean Kaufman revealed in court that his client had planned on pleading not guilty by reason of insanity because he did not know right from wrong at the time of the murders. Later that month, Jacob pleaded not guilty. While he hadn't mentioned the defence of not guilty by reason of insanity, that could be raised in the future. Gabriel's defence would attempt to get his statements to police following his arrest thrown out of evidence. His attorneys argued that his parents were intentionally misled about whether he could have an attorney present. And they were taken through a rarely used door to keep them from three public defenders who were waiting in the lobby of the police department. Judge Looney, however, would find that Gabriel was fully advised of his rights when he cooperated with police and was even advised to cooperate by his father. His defence attorneys would then file a motion requesting that his murder trial be moved to another county because it would be impossible to find an impartial jury. In the motion, they argued the potential jurors would very likely have been tainted by the media coverage of the case. They said that a false report had aired on a news broadcast that was corrected the following day but argued that this had already caused irreversible damage to Gabriel and his defence. Ultimately, Judge Looney would approve the request and move the trial from Teller County to Colorado Springs. Meanwhile, Jacob's defence attorneys would attempt to get some more evidence excluded from the trial. They argued the sheriff's deputies had entered the unlocked home where the murders took place, kicked in a locked bedroom door and then videotaped the crime scene before a search warrant had been signed. Judge Looney, however, argued that this was not unreasonable for sheriff's deputies given the circumstances. They would also attempt to get Jacob's statements to the school counsellor and principal excluded from trial. They claimed that his rights were violated when the principal then called police. 
They also argued that his rights were further violated and police policy ignored when a family friend and Jacob's brother, Charles, were allowed to visit Jacob in custody before he was arrested. Judge Looney refused the request to have this excluded as evidence during the upcoming trial. In April the following year, it would be revealed that Jacob was planning on citing child abuse as a defence. The allegations of child abuse have been thrown around several times throughout the past year and a half, but nothing conclusive had really come out in the media. Many who knew Jacob speculated that he was being abused at home, and this only confirmed their suspicions further. During a hearing regarding the defence, Jacob's defence lawyer Sean Kaufman said, I want the jury to hear about my client's pain. Court documents that were filed revealed that Jacob had told his friends that he hated his mother and stepfather and had felt unloved and resented by his mother from birth. According to the motion, Jacob met with derision early on and endured abuse. From the back of his mother's hand and from the paddle and the belt kept handy in the house. Horrible whippings from these paddles and belts were meted out to Jacob and his brother. Jacob's brother Charles would speak with Frontline. Jacob was conceived to save the marriage, uh, to, to repair it. And he became the representation of her broken dreams. And I think in many, many respects, she resented Jacob's entire existence. The motion would also claim that Jacob had been sexually abused by Kermode who had married Pamela when Jacob was four years old. Defence Kaufman said that he would be arguing that Jacob had feared for his life when he killed Kermode and Pamela, stating, Badder children live in an environment totally different than most in which people aspire to raise their children. Prosecutor Bill Aspinwall would argue that the abuse was immaterial, stating, They just want to badmouth somebody who was shot to death and stabbed in their sleep. He then sarcastically added, let's just say it's okay for a youngster to kill his parents because he had a reason to dislike them. As the trial was fast approaching, the case against Jacob and Gabriel started to take shape. It was evident that Jacob's defence were going to put forward a battered child defence, the first to ever be used in the state of Colorado. While it wasn't a legal defence, long-term abuse can be presented as a defence to establish self-defence. Jury selection for Jacob's trial began in early May of 1994. He was the first of the two teenagers to be standing trial. 500 residents of Teller County were summoned to be questioned as potential jurors, and in less than a week, that was whittled down to 250. A large jury pool was requested due to the media attention that had surrounded the controversial case. By the 11th of May, a jury consisting of 10 women and 4 men was seated and the following day, the murder trial of Jacob Eind began. During opening statements, prosecutor Bill Aspinwall told the jury that Kermode and Pamela had desperately sought out safety in the master bathroom of their home as they were attacked. He said, They can't get in because on the other side of that bathroom door that you have to push your way into is Jacob Eind, holding that door shut. While his co-conspirator is hacking away at his stepfather and mother. He said that when Jacob did open the door, he assaulted the couple by spraying bear mace in their faces. He described how the Jordans, who had been shot and stabbed by this point, were now temporarily blinded. They struggled to breathe as Jacob raised a .357 caliber revolver and shot three times, finally killing the couple. He described how after the couple were dead, Jacob and Gabriel washed the blood from their hands in the bathroom sink. Afterwards, Gabriel walked home where he hid the murder weapons before falling asleep. Prosecutor Aspinwall would portray Jacob as a cold-blooded killer who had planned the murders of his mother and stepfather simply because he hated them. He said, Pamela was chopped at, her skull opening up on the side, the back, the back of her neck. Defence Tom Kennedy, on the other hand, offered a completely different version of the murders and the motivation behind them. He said that when people think of home, they think of it as a place where they can feel love, safety and security. He said, When Jacob Ein thought of home, 
He thought of it as a place full of fear, intimidation, humiliation, degradation, and abuse. And every moment that he had to spend at that home, he spent it trying to avoid contact with his stepfather and his mother. According to Defence Kennedy, Jacob killed his abusive stepfather and his cold and controlling mother, adding, This was only the end of the story, ladies and gentlemen. The story began when Jacob was born. He was putting forward the theory that Jacob had acted in self-defence after suffering years of physical, emotional and sexual abuse, and that he had no alternative and no escape but to resort to murder. He walked the jury through Jacob's early life, stating that Pamela and her first husband, Jacob's father, were in the process of ending their marriage when Pamela discovered that she was pregnant with Jacob, telling the courtroom that Jacob was an unwanted surprise that was an albatross around her neck. He said that there was going to be family members to corroborate the abuse, including Pamela's own mother and his brother. Speaking of Pamela, he said, she had cute pet names for the weapons that she used to discipline Charles and Jacob. Dr. Stick, always hanging, available. Send the boys to fetch Dr. Stick so she can punish these young children. He said that when Jacob was four years old, Pamela married Kermode and the situation in the home changed drastically. He said that Kermode was an alcoholic and when he drank, he turned nasty. He stated, living in that home, Jacob and Charles had no idea when the hammer was going to fall, what they might do to set off Kermode. And because of Pam's desperate need for financial security, she not only tolerated Kermode's behaviour, she mimicked it. According to Defence Kennedy, both Jacob and Charles suffered abuse at the home. Abuse that had left them scarred for life. Some of these memories, he said, were so suppressed and would take years to unravel, but said that what the boys do remember is disgusting, humiliating sexual abuse at the hands of Kermode, as well as beatings with a belt he referred to as Billy Belt. He revealed that Charles had desperately attempted to protect his little brother, but in summer of 1992, he moved out of the family home leaving Jacob to bear the brunt of the abuse alone. He stated, The abuse, the sexual abuse, the violence in this home was the family's dark secret. The first witness during the trial to testify was Woodland High School Principal Jim Taylor, followed by school counsellor David Greathouse, who told the courtroom that on the day Jacob confessed to the murders, he had been scheduled to see a mental health counsellor regarding his depression and anxiety about living at home. He told the courtroom that in the weeks leading up to the murder, he had spoken to Jacob about his home life. On the 10th of December, he had spent two hours speaking with Jacob and Charles about Jacob's increasing anxiety about his life at home. Jacob confided in his counsellor that he couldn't sleep well and struggled to get to sleep before midnight. He said he stayed at school as long as possible so that he didn't have to go home to Kermode and Pamela. And when he did go home, he simply hid in his bedroom. He told the counsellor the last family meal he had was on Thanksgiving of 1992. He said that in the week before the murders, Jacob looked gaunt and appeared depressed and unkempt. According to the counsellor, neither Jacob or Charles had said that they were physically or sexually abused at home, adding that if they had have done, he would have reported it to police. Some evidence had been collected at the boys' high school including a map in Gabriel's locker. It showed his home on Columbine Village Drive and Jacob's home on Ridge Drive around a mile away. There were handwritten directions from one house to the other. The map was marked with Escape Route and Escape Route 2. In Jacob's room, investigators had also recovered a three-foot-long sword, a large folding knife, a smaller knife, a bayonet and three throwing stars. Prosecutor Aspinwall had wanted the jury to see the weapons, to try and show that he was not controlled by Kermode and Pamela. He said, The defendant will say he's unfairly disciplined. Seems to me Pamela Jordan had a right to discipline a 15-year-old boy who had knives in his room. This was an individual who should have been disciplined, and maybe even disciplined more than he was. In Jacob's bedroom, investigators had also found a recipe to make a bomb as well as a letter from his girlfriend, telling him that she too could kill her parents. Police officer Curtis Richer would tell the jury that in Gabriel's bedroom, he had found hidden underneath a pile of clothing, 
a 22 caliber handgun, a .357 caliber called Python handgun, ammunition in a pouch, a large knife and a number of items that had been stained with blood. There was also clothing inside a clothes dryer, which he believed contained clothing that Gabriel had washed to remove blood. The prosecution would reveal that Jacob had a plane ticket to fly from Colorado to Chicago two days after the murder. They highlighted the fact that Jacob said he could not escape the home. However, the plane ticket was from Jacob's birth father, and he sent him one every year so that they could spend Christmas together. Charles, Jacob's brother, would be called as a prosecution witness. He told the jury that he had tried multiple times to tell people that he and Jacob were being abused at home. He had contacted police in 1992 and 1993 to tell them that they were being abused. When Jacob was arrested, during an interview with police, Charles had spoken about verbal put-downs directed at him and his brother by Kermode and Pamela, as well as Kermode's excessive drinking. He said they had a lack of freedom and had some physical punishment and described Kermode and Pamela as uncaring parents who wanted to control the both of them. He said that the only affection within the family's home was between the brothers and the family's dogs. Prosecutor Aspenwall said that during the interview, Charles never mentioned sexual abuse. Charles said to the jury that while the family had enjoyed an upper-middle-class lifestyle, there was very little for him or his brother to be happy about. He said that in August of 1992, he finally moved out of the abusive home and into a small cabin located around half a mile away from his high school. He said that he had moved out because of Kermode, who he described as an alcoholic. He said his mother said that Kermode had quit drinking on at least three occasions, but each time, he started drinking once more. Charles testified that when Kermode drank, he would wake Jacob up and keep him up for hours. He was forced to listen to Kermode as he drunkenly discussed the government and communism. He said, He would also hit me, but he would never remember it the next day. Jacob hated Kermode for it, and so did I. He said how he, Pamela and Jacob, had found Kermode passed out on the floor due to excessive drinking, adding that they had to hide his gun after he came home drunk from a bar, claiming that he was going to shoot somebody who had disagreed with him. Charles said to the jury, We were trapped. We both felt trapped. I moved out because that was available to me by law, whereas Jacob had to stay there three more years. To someone that immature, it seemed like a lifetime. Prosecutor Aspenwall asked Charles why they didn't report the abuse, but he replied that they had tried to, but nobody listened to them. He said that he had spoken to middle school teacher, Lucinda Reed, as well as the counsellor, David Greathouse, and two Teller County Department of Social Services workers. He said that Lucinda had begged Pamela to seek counselling, but he was very critical of David, the counsellor, who had testified, stating, He didn't do a damn thing to help Jacob out. He didn't do his damn job. He said that during his initial interview with police, what he described that went on in the family's home was a shadow of what it was like living in that house. He said that he didn't want to remember what exactly went on at the family's home and that each time he tried to remember, he couldn't function anymore. He said that when he spoke to Jacob after his arrest, he had told him that he wanted the pain to end. The middle school teacher, Lucinda, was called as a witness and she told the courtroom she never suspected that Charles and Jacob were being abused at home because there were no textbook symptoms. While she didn't feel the need to report suspicions of abuse, she said that she did have concerns. She said that in spring of 1992 she had asked Pamela to meet her after Charles told her that Kermode went on drinking binges and passed out. She said that when she met with Pamela, Kermode was there so the discussion never came up, but she did suggest to the family that they attend counselling. She said, Kermode was not receptive at all. He didn't say anything. A couple of months later, Pamela called Lucinda and said that Kermode had agreed to seek counselling, but she would later learn that they never actually attended any counselling. Jacob's girlfriend, Stephanie Ensley, would tell the courtroom about her relationship with Jacob. She said that they used to chat on the phone well into the night and would talk about practically anything, even their parents. She said that on the 16th of December, Jacob had told her that he hated his stepfather and mother, adding that he had a gun and was going to shoot them both. 
This conversation was around 11pm. Within two hours, Kermode and Pamela would be dead. Stephanie said that she did not believe that Jacob was being serious. When Jacob and Stephanie spoke about their parents, Jacob confided in her that he was being physically and emotionally abused. She said to the jury that she often saw bruising and marks to his neck, shoulders, upper back and upper arms. She said, He didn't mind doing some chores, but he had to do everything. Another friend of Jacob would testify during the trial. David Maybe said that Jacob had erroneously believed that Gabriel had been bailed out of jail. He told the courtroom that Jacob, who was in jail, then called him up. Jacob told David that he was worried that Gabriel would hurt his surviving family, in particular his brother Charles. He then said, I need you to find somebody to get major. David asked what he meant and Jacob allegedly replied, think. When prosecutor Gordon Dennison asked what David thought Jacob meant, he responded, I thought he meant to find him, and I guess, shoot him. He additionally told the courtroom that Jacob had asked him several times to help him kill his stepfather and mother because he was tired of them telling him what to do. Armand de Lee, a classmate, would describe Jacob to the jury as a loud, obnoxious geek who did not get on very well with his classmates. He said he didn't believe that he was being abused at home and said, One time he told me he got somebody to kill his parents by the name of Major. It seemed kind of like a joke because I never thought Jacob would do anything like that. Armanda and Jacob had been good friends, he said, and often went hiking together and even had sleepovers. He said that Jacob was always pleasant while at his home, but he wanted to keep his distance from his own mother and stepfather. While Armanda said he didn't believe that Jacob was abused, he contradicted himself when he said, He always, for as long as I knew him, talked about how much he hated his parents. He said his parents would beat him and put him through mental head trips. In further testimony, Dr. David Bowerman would take the courtroom through the injuries that had been inflicted on Kermode and Pamela. He said that Kermode had been shot a total of five times, while Pamela had been shot three times. The fatal bullets that ended their life were fired from between, between 20 to 30 inches away. The prosecution rested their case, and now it was time for the defence to present theirs. While some testimony would be presented in regards to life at the family home, it would be ramped up by the defence. They were claiming, after all, that Jacob was a battered child. Testimony would then be presented by some of the family. Kermode's cousin, Doug Kermode, described how when Jacob was around five years old, he witnessed Kermode slap him. Emotion overcame Doug as he said he believed that Kermode had given Charles and Jacob the right guidance, such as when he encouraged them to befriend a disfigured boy. However, he and Kermode's first wife testified that Kermode could be violent, especially when he was drunk. He detailed how when Kermode slapped Jacob very hard, He then set up a camera and wanted to take a photograph of Jacob crying, but other family members stepped in. Barbara Tarantine, Kermode's first wife, would tell the courtroom that Kermode had slapped and punched her and pushed up against a wall on several occasions. She said, I would have to describe Kermode's behaviour in a domestic situation as violent as opposed to peaceful. Luby Thornson, Pamela's close friend of 20 years, would say that she had always believed that Pamela was far too tough on her children. She portrayed her friend as a cold and strict mother, who had hit her son at least twice. She said, It was control. It was a set pattern. Six o'clock they were in bed. If they broke that rule, there were consequences. If there were certain gestures or words they used, she would make them bite into a bar of soap. She spoke about Dr. Stick, the wooden paddle that was kept in the family's kitchen. Loopy had seen Pamela strike Jacob on the bare bottom because he had come out of his bedroom after he was sent to sleep. Loopy described one incident which took place when Jacob was just nine months old. Well, not only was she unhappy with her marriage, she was also unhappy with being pregnant with her second child. He was about eight, nine months old, and we went in. She did not know I had followed her in there. And she just kind of grabbed Jacob, and she goes, I just hate you, I just... She goes, I wish you had never been born, you know. When Pamela noticed that Loopy was there and had heard what she said, she quickly picked up Jacob and began cuddling him. 
She said that Charles was a little bit chunky as a child, and Pamela and Kermode would often make fun of him for his weight, and even forced him to eat celery and carrots, while the rest of the family had hamburgers and french fries. When Jacob was a child, he had a bit of a stutter, and Luby said that Kermode and Pamela would mock him for his speech impediment. Speaking about Kermode's drinking, she said one day she had come to the family's home to find him passed out, stinking of alcohol and the furniture in complete disarray. Charles would also be called to testify once more, and this time he went into disturbing detail about what went on behind closed doors at the home. He said that he and Jacob had both suffered years of sexual abuse at the hands of Kermode, adding that it mostly took place when they returned home from school. He chillingly stated, We didn't know if it was going to happen that day or not, and we didn't know who he was going to choose, but we knew it was going to happen by the look on his face. He said that Kermode would tie them to the toilet, get them undressed and then tie their hands and feet so they couldn't move. Charles then said, Charles said that the sexual abuse started when he was around eight years old and Jacob was around four years old. He said that their mother, Pamela, used a heavy hand and would wash their mouths with soap, hit them with a belt, a wooden spoon and a cutting board. These punishments were meted out if the boys ever said no to her, left toys out, watched the wrong TV channel or played in the back garden without permission. He revealed that they kept a calendar to document his weight as well as how many lashes he and his brother received with the belt and switches. Charles recollected how on one day he had been hit 32 times during a spanking. As he said, he had looked at Kermode the wrong way. He went back to detail the sexual abuse that had happened in the bathroom of the family home. During these sexual assaults, Kermode would hit Charles and Jacob. He went into quite graphic detail about what happened during these sexual assaults. Tell us given first, then tell us she would start, start to masturbate. And after he was done, she would get dressed. And say, you're so f***ing dirty. Go and take a shower. Afterwards, Kermode would order the boys to shower because they were dirty. He described how on one occasion he had returned home early from elementary school. Jacob, who was in kindergarten at the time, was home already. And he said to the courtroom he heard Jacob screaming and pleading for Kermode to stop. He said, I knew what was going on. I heard the same words, the same kind of words. I slammed the door really loudly so that he could hear it because hopefully Kermode would stop if he knew that I was home. He didn't. Charles said to the jury that he had tried to tell his mother about the sexual abuse one day when Kermode was passed out drunk, but nevertheless, she didn't leave Kermode. Charles said that before his mother married Kermode, she was a warm and loving mother but she became cold and hateful. According to Charles, he and Jacob had remained quiet about the sexual abuse because Kermode had instilled fear in them by threatening to kill them if they ever told anybody about what he did to them in the bathroom. He said, I vowed after the first bathroom session that I was never going to tell anybody, mainly because Kermode and Mom told us that nobody would believe us if we did. He said that he still struggled to talk about the sexual abuse even to his therapist. Charles would speak with Frontline about the testimony during his brother's trial. I did my best as far as explaining to the court the type of environment that we were in. The pain that we were experiencing and being inflicted upon. Even the sexual abuse. I broke my code of silence. And in front of the whole world to see, with the cameras rolling and everything, he would um, wait until we got home, oftentimes sneaking up behind me, or Jacob, and um, 
throwing us into the bathroom, literally taking us by the shoulders and tossing us into the in the bathroom. And um, there he would hit hit us across the face and uh, body and and say, "Get on the toilet." And um, he he would pull the ropes out from underneath the credenza. Um, always laughing. It, it, it was always, it, it, I mean, to say it was maniacal would be an understatement. Just laughing, chuckling, pleased with himself. Psychiatrist Dr. David Castor would compare Jacob to a prisoner of war, explaining to the courtroom that child abuse is an intentional, pervasive, and sadistic attack on a child's person, their soul, with specific intent to control. He said, Prisoners of war know about this. He said that every day in the Jordan household was torment for Jacob and Charles, and he explained the battered children don't flee their environment because they feel as though there is no escape. He stated that Jacob told him on one occasion Pamela ordered him to climb a ladder to clean a second-story window. Jacob was terrified of heights, and he begged his mother not to force him to climb the ladder, but she did nevertheless. She promised she would keep her foot on the bottom of the ladder, but when Jacob got up to the top, she left. Jacob remained up there until Kermode came home hours later. He detailed further abuse at the home, including Jacob and Charles being forced to clean the hardwood floors over and over again over the course of 24 hours until they got it right. They were ordered to clean the dishwasher with a toothbrush. Dr. Castor and another psychologist, Dr. Frank Barron, could classify Jacob as legally insane, but they said he was a fearful child who had lived in constant expectation of harm. Another psychologist, Dr. Anne Hicks-Taylor, who interviewed Jacob after the murders, testified that he had told her he took non-prescription drugs and played Russian roulette to try and kill himself in the days leading up to the murders. She said, Jacob didn't get any counselling, so the pressure continued to build. His options continued to die. When you're in a debilitating state, the way you see the world is so fearful anyway, you lose all ability to think you can get out of it. She said that the breaking point for Jacob was Charles moving out of the home because Charles had been the buffer in the family who had saved him from some of the abuse. She said he held on to a rescue fantasy that his brother could somehow save him, but when he left, that fantasy was shattered. Jacob's grandmother, Grace Tambeth, would beg the jury to save her grandson, telling them, Jacob has a good heart. Please help him. Please. Grace was the mother of Pamela and she corroborated the abuse. She said that her daughter was loyal and loving, but said she had witnessed her spank both boys extremely hard and she had told her to stop, but Pamela ignored her. She described Kermode as somebody who made her skin crawl and she believed that Kermode had changed her daughter. Also called to the witness stand was the 22-year-old son of a longtime friend of Pamela. He was set to tell the courtroom that when he was eight years old, Pamela had fondled his penis and forced him to touch her inappropriately. However, the judge would rule that he couldn't testify in regards to this because Pamela had not been accused of sexually assaulting her sons, just Kermode. Closing arguments were to follow. Prosecutor Aspinwall said to the jury, This isn't a case about parricide, the killing of your parents. Those are words that make murder palatable. He urged them to forget about the question of abuse and instead focus on the question of self-defence, stating, It's imminent. It's going to be happening soon. Not being spanked. Not being put in a closet. Not being slapped in the face. You have to be afraid of being killed before you can take someone else's life. Defence Kaufman said that the abuse was much more than just a simple spanking, stating, This is a case about terror, about a lifetime of terror, and Jacob Ein's life is about how a child, through a course of 15 years, could be the victim of a kind of terrorism of the soul. He said that the jury were only shown a glimpse of the horrors that were inflicted on Jacob and Charles. He said that self-defence should be measured by the totality of Jacob's life. The evidence presented during the trial was extremely polarising. On one hand, Kermode and Pamela were described as abusive parents, and on the other, 
They were painted as caring parents who wanted the best for their family. The crux of the case would be whether the jury believed that Jacob had been abused at home and whether he felt as though there was no other alternative than to murder his mother and stepfather. The testimony presented by the defence in particular was extremely disturbing and heartbreaking and illustrated a very terrible home life for both Jacob and his brother Charles. It was now up to the jury to decide whether Jacob was guilty of first-degree murder or not guilty. The verdict reads, we the jury find the defendant Jacob Ein guilty of first-degree murder. They would ultimately find Jacob Ein guilty of the murder of Kermode and Pamela Jordan. A juror would state that they felt as though they had been backed into a corner by evidence and Colorado law, stating, the main thing was that he confessed to doing it. Under Colorado law, self-defence only applies when somebody feels imminent danger or serious bodily injury or death. Jacob showed little emotion as the verdict was read aloud. He smiled as the jurors were led from the courtroom and even said, good job, to the prosecutor. His defence lawyer stated, I guess my gut feeling about this case is that it's too bad somebody didn't react until it was too late. Jacob Eind is a good kid. He just never had a chance. The problem is the law doesn't recognise the situation a child finds himself in. Self-defence is the bar fight scenario, not years and years of abuse, where you finally explode. Jacob was automatically handed to life without parole sentences. Judge Looney lamented her inability to sentence him to something more lenient. She said, I'm not saying that a long sentence including a life sentence, is not appropriate for first-degree murder. I think it is. But what I think may be inappropriate is that at some point in the future, parole may not be considered for any individual. She said that she would have preferred to structure Jacob's sentence based on the facts of the case. Jacob read aloud a letter in which he criticised the justice system, as well as his defence attorneys, for not allowing the real truth to be known. Judge Looney asked him what he meant, and he said that while some of the truth came out, it had been distorted. He said, Oh well, what's done is done. Can't gripe about the past much. He said that his future, albeit spent in prison, would be better than his past. Gabriel Adams would stand trial shortly thereafter, and he too would be found guilty of the murders of Kermode and Pamela Jordan. Much like Jacob, He was handed two life sentences without parole. Over the forthcoming years, Jacob would appeal his murder conviction and his life sentences, and so would Gabriel. In 1998, Jacob revealed that Kermode wasn't the only one to sexually abuse him. He said that his own mother had sexually abused him, but he was not allowed to present the evidence during trial. He was hoping to gain a new trial, and his family were all supporting him. Pamela's own sister... Cindy Sandots revealed that Pamela herself was an abused child, and as an adult, she in turn abused her children. It was allegedly her stepfather who had abused her. Loopy, who testified during the first trial, would reveal that on one occasion, when Jacob wasn't older than four months old, she had witnessed Pamela fondling his penis. It was Loopy's son, Eric who had wanted to testify that Pamela had sexually abused him too when he was just eight years old. He stated, The kids are not lying. Jacob said that memories of sexual abuse at the hands of his own mother went back to when he was four or five years old. He said that she had forced him to perform oral sex on her. In 2012, the United States Supreme Court ruled that mandatory sentences of life in prison without parole for crimes committed by juveniles, violated the constitutional ban on cruel and unusual punishment. It was retroactive, meaning that it applied to older cases too. This meant that Jacob and Gabriel could one day be released from prison. Just two years later, however, Gabriel hanged himself in his cell at the San Carlos Correctional Facility. His suicide had come before he got the chance to go before the parole board and fight for parole. He had been housed in a prison for those who were mentally ill. He had suffered from extreme paranoia and had refused visits. He was said to not be in touch with reality. In 2018, Jacob was granted a new trial. 
Judge Jane Tidball ordered that his murder convictions were vacated because he was denied his constitutional right to testify during his first trial. Instead of stand trial again, Jacob pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, explaining that he plotted the murders to end a lifetime of torture, abuse and despair. He was resentenced to 60 years in prison, which meant that he could apply for parole in just a couple of years. In March of 2021, Jacob Eind was paroled from prison. His father, Charles, was waiting for him at the prison's parking lot along with his wife, Denise, who he had married while behind bars. During his years of incarceration, Jacob had received a paralegal certificate and earned a PhD in theology. Currently, Jacob lives alone in an apartment while his wife lives in Ireland, where she is originally from. He has said that he hopes one day to move to Ireland to be with his wife, where he is hopeful that he can live a peaceful and quiet life of anonymity. For years, I mean, when things get real bad, I'd be able to tell myself, okay, but they'll be gone soon. I'd say, oh, I don't have to put up with it much longer. I took sanctuary within that fantasy of it being over. And it's still almost half fantasy for me, all the way up till the point of the murders. I mean, even when up until the first trigger was actually pulled, it was still, to me, half fantasy. All I wanted was something to end. I didn't really grasp the permanency of their deaths. Definitely didn't understand the gravity of what it means to kill somebody. I mean, I didn't think that they would feel pain. I didn't think that anybody else would be affected. The murder of Kermod and Pamela Jordan rocked the quiet community of Woodland Park. By first appearances, it seemed like a typical case of a rebellious teenager lashing out at his parents. However, it soon became apparent that the case was much more complex than that. Jacob Eind had been the victim of more than a decade of physical, emotional and sexual abuse that ultimately culminated with the brutal murders of his tormentors. Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so, so much for listening. I'd also like to say a big, big thank you to my amazing new Patreon supporters, Clara and Rachel. The support on Patreon seriously goes such a long way. As you all know, I'm a one-woman show and it helps to defray the costs of freedom of information requests, archive subscriptions, hosting, and much more. In return for your support on Patreon, I send out a handwritten thank you card and merch. You also get bonus episodes of Morphology Plus, which aren't on the regular podcast platforms, ad-free and early release episodes, behind the scenes including case files, videos and audio, and of course, my undying love. Just a little reminder that I'm going to CrimeCon in London in June of 2022. Last year was absolutely amazing. It was so fun to get to hang out with some fellow podcasters and some of my listeners. So if you want to hang out and have a beer and talk all things true crime, make sure to get a ticket. Use my code WINDOW, as in the shattered window, to get 10% off your ticket. Remember to check us out at morbidology.com for more information about this episode and to read our true crime articles. And please stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear a promo for the new show, Guilty Greenie. Until next time, take care of yourselves, stay safe and have an amazing week. Hello and welcome to Guilty Greeny. I feel like we should start off this show by saying it's nearly impossible to be 100% sustainable given the current world we live in. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Not a great analogy for a vegetarian, but say, you know. We're talking uh, about sustainability, <laughs> maybe not the best analogy. Don't eat the elephant is the first rule of the guilty green. <laughs> There's your first challenge of the week. <laughs> Avoid <laughs> elephants. <laughs> what they used to call frugal is now considered sustainable. That's such an aha moment. Frugal to sustainable. 
You can save money and help the planet. That's going to be our new tagline for sure. Yeah, tag. You can find Guilty Greenie on Apple Podcasts or whichever podcast platform you prefer. And join us in tackling the Guilty Greenie challenges. Until then, stay curiously green. Green.